Good morning. My name is uh, Jeff Brady. I'm uh, from not, not good still. Just keep trying. OK. Uh, I'm from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, in the Washington, D.C. area, part of the federal government, uh, Health and Human Services. It's really a, a pleasure to be here with you today. Just very briefly, um, my background, I'm a preventive medicine physician, um, uh, sort of trained uh, initially in the Navy, transferred to the Public Health Service now. And um, the pr research program that I manage, I'm going to tell you some more about. But our main topic is patient safety. And the entire agency that I work for, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, is focused on healthcare quality and safety. So safety is a big part of our mission. So um, with that, I want to jump right in. I want to um, start by thanking uh, Stephanie for reaching out uh, to our agency to um, invite us here. It's really great. I think this, the, the heart of this conference really is consistent with kind of our approach, which is to in, engage a broad range of stakeholders. Um, I think this group is, is even farther outside of kind of the, the classic sweet spot of the folks we engage with, with who are primarily clinicians, healthcare system leaders, but again, we are, um, as you'll hear, uh, expanding our reach and our focus. Um, uh, quite simply, it's, uh, I think Stephanie did a great job of teeing up um, what, what I'm gonna say, which is um, we, we focus on what causes uh, harm to patients. So obviously no one wants this to happen, um, but I think over the past 20 years or so in particular, uh, since the release of the seminal report to Air as Human from the Institute of Medicine that really opened our eyes to patient safety issues and concerns and again the, the realization that in spite of the primary focus of healthcare to improve health status, unfortunately in too many cases we actually harm patients, whether that's with medication errors, healthcare associated infections, um, miscommunication that sort of uh, creates the opportunity for those and other problems like pressure ulcers, um, whatever it is, um, nobody wants patients to leave worse than they come to healthcare. But again, it happens all too often. And I'll say a little bit more about that, including some data that we, um, uh, that really helps drive our program. So again, thank you to, to Stephanie, also to our host, Nortech, and, and the folks here at Harvard for um, hosting us uh, in this great space. So make sure I've got the right, oops. human factors issue. There we go, okay. So again, uh, from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality on behalf of uh, my boss, the agency director, Mr. Gopal Khanna, again, thank you for having us. Um, so just to kind of keep on this same theme of, of patient safety, so this is gonna be very broad contextually. Again, we think about um, healthcare associated infections, basically anything in the healthcare environment, including the structures, processes, that um, hopefully are moving towards the outcomes that we want, but again, in some cases, unfortunately, drive us down other paths that are absolutely not where we want to take patients. Um, it's a very complex um, uh, environment, the healthcare environment is. And so um, we, uh, in some cases, uh, frankly, confuse ourselves with all the factors we're trying to keep track of. Um, so this slide here is really an attempt to lump more of those factors into some common underlying um, uh, themes and, and sets of factors that uh, contribute to healthcare safety problems and, and frankly why it's so hard to make healthcare safer. Obviously, again, it's a complex environment and it's complex in many different dimensions. Not only the technical things we're doing with clinical care, but organizationally, just think about it from a patient's perspective. Most of us are patients or we have family members who are. It's complex organizationally. Just when you get referred to a specialist, sometimes that's another organization altogether. Are they gonna get my information? Are they gonna have to repeat my story? Are they using the same electronic health record? All those, and billing, how is billing gonna work? What am I gonna be responsible for? Layers and layers of organizational complexity, administrative complexity, et cetera. And these are at all levels of the system. In some cases, it's moving across town to a specialist that you're gonna see that you've been referred to. In other cases, it's moving down the hall to the radiology department. Um, is, that, is that result gonna make it back so that the provider, the clinician that ordered it can uh, get the result and act on it? Again, all with the idea of improving health, obviously. Um, uh, this is, uh, I'm a bit um, nervous about saying it to this group. Uh, engineers get, I think, great 
fundamental training and systems and the importance of systems. Unfortunately, um, I can tell you, um, as a physician, we don't. <laughs> we don't uh, really understand system concepts as well as we need to. Um, I have a hopeful slide at the end of the presentation that sort of demonstrates that that's changing um, and hopefully changing in a pretty dramatic and, and fast way. Um, and I've also mentioned, again, communication. Poor communication is at the heart of a lot of challenges, and, and that impedes our ability to improve safety. So keep these in mind, if you will, um, as we go through, because just about every problem that I'm talking about and also the solutions that we're bringing to bear on those problems are, are working on these various sets of factors. So a little bit more about uh, our agency, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Um, these are the three main buckets of activities that we support. We are fundamentally a research agency, so we're um, uh, very similar to the National Institutes of Health. Unlike NIH, our main focus is on health care, not necessarily health and biomedical systems. We're focused on processes, um, health care delivery, what does the system look like, um, again, is it achieving the results that we intend it to achieve. We um, have realized that just producing knowledge is not enough, especially based on the topic that we're trying to address, health care delivery. We've got to translate those materials, that knowledge, into materials, resources that really help teach and train healthcare professionals and systems so that we can actually, again, bring that information, that knowledge to bear. Um, one of the things I've said over the years um, leading the program that I lead is in many cases we're playing catch up on the theoretical side. We're dealing with doctors, nurses, other technicians who don't have uh, the fundamental theoretical background in systems or even in management, in communication, in um, culture. And so um, our tools are not only telling them how they can, uh, showing them, demonstrating how they can improve their systems, but we're kind of sneaking in theory because they don't have it, right? You know, so, so we're, we're um, playing catch up. Again, I'm, I'm leading up to um, a hopeful slide at the end that will um, put us hopefully in, in, in a better frame of mind for what the um, road ahead looks like. And then finally, we're constantly tracking uh, with measures and data um, how we're doing, how we're improving. And the other point I want to make about measurement is we're focused on improving our ability to measure. If you're following kind of healthcare policy uh, circles now and actually for the past um, decade or more, there's a lot of talk about provider burnout and the burden of measurement. This is a very real scenario where um, uh, we're stuck in this situation of recognizing we need to probably measure more or at least improve what we need to measure, but there is appropriate pushback from the field. You know, stop, enough, we, we can't measure more. Um, one of the things we also see is we spend most of our capacity on measurement and that leaves very little capacity for actual improvement and use of the measures. So balancing all that out, that's just yet another challenge that we have and how can we measure more efficiently Information technology offers us some hope there, but that has also been a challenge. And in the um, almost 30 years that I've been in healthcare, the, the promise of uh, health information technology hasn't quite delivered completely yet. And it's actually um, talked about as an important source of burnout, the clinician having to manage not only the clinical scenario and the patient, but also the electronic systems and, you know, are they treating a computer versus the patient? You've probably read about this. So what are our more specific priorities in patient safety? I've mentioned we're focused on the causes of harm, um, really understanding why it occurs and how to prevent it. You can think about this as the basic research of patient safety, just what presents uh, problems, uh, such as venous thromboembolism, blood clots that patients get. Um, what are the patient factors that, that predispose to that? Which patient should we worry about that in? And, and which patient should we maybe be concerned about other risks that are more, more common, uh, that might be more common in that particular patient scenario. Um, I mentioned the, the need to work on applying the knowledge. We um, uh, sort of translate that into our own program, not just agency-wide, but in patient safety. Um, Congress has really been kind to us on the healthcare-associated infections front. More than half of the funding that we receive for patient safety uh, through appropriations is dedicated to healthcare associated infections. They're sort of recognized at, um, as being at the cutting edge of patient safety. I think that's due in part to the fact that there is actually something a little bit more tangible that is a bad thing. It's the closest thing we have to cancer in the, in the quality and safety world where we can point to something in a petri dish or on a list, you know, a bad infection. Um, 
but it has a lot of similarities to the other problems in patient safety. And, and I think we're, we're getting some of the benefits of, um, of more efficient work on addressing things not piecemeal, HAIs over here, falls over here, medication safety over here, but there's kind of this underlying foundation of organizational capacity that actually has some relevance to all of those. So some of the efficiency that we're working on is what are the common things that can help uh, prevent patient safety problems and what are the specific tailored things, perhaps like airflow and, and, and better air management. Um, I've already talked about communication and engagement. This is not just among the professionals who work in the health space every day, but the role of the patient is critical too because we know as care shifts more to the outpatient setting, we're not with patients to sort of guide them every step of the way. So we've got to communicate better, provide them with information support, um, who to call, where to go, um, what kind of direction do we want to give them so that they can uh, be a more active role in their own patient. And a lot of this last bullet here about capacity really um, should almost uh, more clearly be labeled efficiency because there really is not a lot of appetite for putting more, more into healthcare from a resource perspective. So I think some of it will be reallocation of existing resources, hopefully using data to guide those effectively, lining everything up with the, the, most, the highest priority risks for different patients. But um, some of the capacity is actually um, bringing knowledge to bear that doesn't exist in a, in a really um, robust way in healthcare, uh, like your fields of engineering and architecture, et cetera. So um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but um, I think it's, it's actually uh, simplified when you think about the complexity of healthcare. But this is sort of the process that we go through for patient safety research. That second column is labeled patient safety research. This is really the heart of our program, the kind of work that we fund. But the slide is busier, and there are things upstream to the left and downstream to the right because we, um, I think part of our success has been due to considerations about the context in which our work uh, sits. I mentioned burnout as one of the contextual factors. You can see that on the lower left. Um, again, we're, we're trying to support the workforce um, at a time when they are um, almost too supported. <laughs> the, the sort of scenario I often think about is the safety and quality folks in the hospital are probably not always the most popular or any healthcare setting. In fact, in some cases, um, clinicians who know who they are, if they see them and they can duck down another hallway, they do that because they know another opportunity is coming their way for another project. Um, some of the evolution of patient safety um, is actually to step away from the project by project approach because this just adds more and more layers and sort of think about safety more holistically um, actually doing that, it sounds good, but actually doing that is a bit harder than it sounds, and, but I think we're making some progress. So health policy, again, I've mentioned that as a contextual factor. The, the heart of the program is understanding risks and hazards, the basic safety research, integrating that with care, because the other way that I've sort of represented this is uh, when patients come into the hospital, just as one example of a setting, they often have an admitting diagnosis. Even if the, the, their, their diagnosis is not known, there's usually some suspicion or there's a um, um, preliminary diagnosis or what have you. Um, uh, central line associated bloodstream infections is one of the more common patient safety events that we've actually made a lot of progress on. Um, I've never seen in my career a patient admitted with the diagnosis of prevention of myoclapsy. So, right, so, so patient safety is still this sort of thing off to the side, yet we know that it can become the most important thing because when a patient gets a clapsy, um, you better believe that, that that can be very important for that patient and their family. So, so this, this tension between um, recognizing patient safety as important, but also recognizing it's not the only thing. How do we sort of balance that efficiency and truly integrate it? Um, and, and create work systems that, that are um, conducive to actual care and, and are feasible and realistic. And then this, this implementation column is really critical as well because typically um, what we've had in patient safety is great discoveries that work in a um, pristine research environment, but they don't translate well. And in many cases, those are because of the things you, you see in this column. Uh, Jeffrey Thompson's uh, presentation yesterday was great. I can just point to that. I don't know where he is in the room, if he's here, but yes. So um, basically what he said, <laughs> all of those things, if they're not in place, 
Um, it doesn't matter how uh, correct the technical answer is, you're not going to get there with your organization. That's, I think, increasingly appreciated and recognized. So again, it's this combination of the technical and um, the social, uh, cultural aspects. How can we marry those up uh, in, in the right, uh, with the right recipe that ultimately gets us where we want to be to improve, um, uh, reduce risk and improve safety overall? So, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Jeff also did a great job of reminding us all that patients and their families are at the center of this um, very complex and, and apparently chaotic, not always chaotic, but it appears chaotic to, to many of us who are in healthcare or just interact with it as patient, uh, patients or families. Um, and all these, these issues are swirling around, whether it's optimizing technology, getting information uh, to the right people in timely ways, in the right way, so that the most important thing actually appears to be the most important thing. Lots of factors uh, swirling around, um, uh, around that, that fundamental uh, goal of, of giving patients the best care that we can. So um, this is one of the good news slides. Um, we, I think, uh, are not only discovering these things, but they're actually having an impact on a national scale. So one of our um, uh, activities that I mentioned is measurement. And so this is some measurement we've done. Um, we're getting ready to update it. So in the next few weeks, I hope we'll have out the results for the 2014 to 2016 uh, period. But we really have seen some unprecedented reductions. We saw some between 2010 and 2014. 17 percent reduction overall in this hospital setting and the set of hospital acquired conditions. So this is a list of about 10 different things that I've already mentioned like uh, pressure ulcers or pressure injuries, medication events, um, all kinds of healthcare associated infections. And um, I think it's really impressive that we're not just improving in one of those areas as a nation but actually across the board and um, that gives me some some uh, hope for, for what we can continue to do. Um, I do get a little bit worried that we're preventing uh, only the, the easier ones, and so what's left is going to be harder to prevent. So um, although the 2014 to 2016 data looks pretty good, beyond that it's going to be really interesting. I think we're going to need to up our game as a nation, so we're trying to maintain that pace. So, so we'll see. One of the other things that's been really rewarding for our program is um, patient safety events doesn't really grab a lot of people's attention. They might think this is the average person on the street, or in some cases even the average clinician. And so translating those um, somewhat wonky labels into meaningful impact that people understand, usually deaths and dollars get people's attention. And I can tell you these are pretty conservative estimates. One of the things we didn't want to do was um, inflate this uh, uh, in a way that wasn't supported by the evidence. Again, we're fundamentally a research agency. So, so this is really a pretty conservative that, um, you know, based on uh, our best review of a lot of literature that shows um, when you have these events, uh, patients that have them and patients that don't, all other things being equal, what, what are the costs of care? What are the differentials? That's what, what we see there. And then most importantly, what are the different mortalities? And so um, I would invite you all to go look at the information we have and, and kick the tires on it because, frankly, we want more input to make sure that this is meaningful to others. And, and um, certainly if you all have data in your own uh, organizations or organizations that you work with, we'd like to bring that to bear too and sort of test the the, um, how representative this is uh, at the local level, um, but we're, we're pretty happy with it. So this, this um, I'm now getting into some work that I think is, is pretty closely associated with a lot of the work you do. Um, we labeled this uh, particular series of grants patient safety learning laboratories. Um, these are not about education. They really are about discovery and, and sort of the typical research approaches that we use. Although this one was not so typical. This is um, really uh, a program that uh, the P30 there is a grant mechanism. So for those of you who do research, um, uh, we, we use, again, some of the same mechanisms that the National Institutes of Health use. These are center-based grants. So the, the heart of, of these programs uh, is sort of interdisciplinary teams. So think uh, clinicians, doctors, nurses. Think also engineers. Um, think in some cases the CFO and the C-suite, bringing them together in what we've termed uh, learning laboratories where they can work on not only single problems, uh, HAIs or, or what have you, uh, obstetrical errors, 
but actually sets of problems that, that contribute to those errors. So for example, one of the uh, projects at uh, Stanford University looks at the labor and delivery suite and um, sets of problems like uh, the display uh, monitor that clinicians use in real time during the delivery process. Is that uh, in the right location? Does it have the right clinical factors appropriately prioritized and prominent on the display so that all the team can see it and it's clear that everybody's sort of treating the same patient and the same numbers at the same time? Some, something as simple as that actually. Um, healthcare hasn't always done a great job in thinking through these um, engineering uh, uh, principles that I think are probably very obvious to you. So I think there's a lot of, of, of opportunity here to do more. Um, that same project is also looking at um, the delivery table. Um, and as care shifts, uh, for example, the, um, uh, there's recognition that delaying the um, clamping and cutting of the umbilical cord actually has benefits to, um, to the patient. And so um, how do you do that? What does the delivery table look like in a way that doesn't add more risk to the patient. Um, and so that's another part of, again, this combined set of, of issues that uh, Stanford is looking at. So th th these are very um, real projects that are, that are looking at things in a, in a comprehensive, more holistic way. And I can tell you that some of the challenges that these groups have encountered really relate to um, communication, the vocabulary that different, uh, different fields use. But they've, a lot of their early work is sort of establishing that common way of working and learning, and I think they're making a lot of progress. I'd invite you to look at, at the um, other project descriptions that we have online. And I should just briefly mention there uh, is some great work by the Institute of Medicine and uh, the Presidential uh, Committee that um, have looked at this intersection of engineering and healthcare, and hopefully you all are well aware of these, but these have provided a lot of uh, the foundational background for, for this work. So this is uh, one of the other uh, patient safety learning labs, uh, learning lab examples. This one is at Ohio State and it's the Institute for Design of, uh, um, Institute for the Design of Environments Aligned for Patient Safety. And so um, th they're looking at a, a host of related issues, uh, things like cardiac alarms and how they affect decision making, sort of real time HAI surveillance. It's compelling for us to look back and see what happened, but I think one thing that a lot of uh, sort of the cutting edge groups in patient safety are looking at, how do we get the right data in real time and hopefully intervene and prevent before HAIs or other types of patient safety events occur. So again, some exciting work. I wish I had more time to tell you more about it, but happy to answer questions. So um, uh, this is another area that Congress has recognized and been interested in. We're now on our third round. Uh, the grants for this third round are in review right now. The, the application period has closed. I'm hopeful we'll have the opportunity to um, solicit more applications, but um, we're looking forward to reviewing and announcing this next set. Um, we've shifted the grant mechanism, but fundamentally the, the interest in, in our work hasn't changed. We now use this R18 demonstration grant, very kind of active and and associated with care itself in the field and implementation and, and demonstrating these principles. Again, at the heart of these design principles, systems engineering, but also our traditional area of health services research, all of those combined. Um, another related area is healthcare simulation. Folks have a general awareness of, of simulation and how it's used uh, in training, um, but also in, in research. So we have uh, funded uh, this work for, for some time. It's um, very closely related to patient safety, um, not exclusively in the, in the emergency department, but that's a, that's a classic area where that applies uh, the use of simulation methodology. Think of things happening quick uh, in real time. It's very conducive to, to studying, um, again, in a short time frame where things are a bit more explicitly happening in the clinical environment. But, but again, it's applicable in many other clinical settings as well. Um, these are just a few of the things that we have disseminated uh, with respect to, to simulation. We um, worked with the society, to uh, the simulation society, to publish a dictionary that they had done a lot of word on, work on to help standardize the terms and, and sort of what are we all talking about with simulation. It's one of the bigger challenges in these emerging fields is, again, what are the standards? How do you um, advance? Uh, the science when people are not necessarily using terminology in the same way. So that was what was behind 
the simulation dictionary. And that other um, cover that you see there, this is um, um, a publication we disseminated uh, during the Ebola epidemic. And while it's focused on the Ebola epidemic, the intent really was to open people's eyes to the use of simulation in a very real world setting. Uh, patient transport was the issue here. And I think a lot of hospitals that had heavy simulation capabilities realized that they could, uh, in some cases, if they hadn't planned tr patient transport effectively, um, knock out the um, access to big parts, if not their entire healthcare facility due to contamination. So better to know that in a simulated way and uh, work to address it and then test the solutions rather than be in the midst of responding to an epidemic and um, again, you've sort of taken your whole uh, healthcare um, facility offline because um, you know problems weren't uh, sort of worked out in advance. So um, uh, again, it's a pretty exciting space and this is an ongoing funding opportunity announcement and I'm, I'm really proud of our simulation work and the, the folks in our program that, that run that. So um, we've uh, published a bit on simulation and this is sort of, as I start to wrap up here, the um, one of the things we try to do is push the field to outcomes. Most everything I've talked about, uh, you know, we are interested in methodology, but we are primarily interested in the outcomes related to patient safety. So everything we're doing is in pursuit of that uh, to include simulation. And what we found is a bit of stagnation in some cases in the field where folks are um, sort of working on um, talking about simulation just as, uh, as a, a good experience um, and not necessarily taking that next leap of connecting it to patient outcomes, and in our case, patient safety. So we want to move past those questions about um, how did people like simulation? Do they feel like they learned something? And although it's more methodologically challenging, move to that next step of does it actually improve patient safety? Some other issues uh, such as um, skill acquisition, maintenance, and, and, and skill progression. If you think about the life cycle of a clinician, what are the, you know, is simulation really just about early learning? Or especially in cases where you have low case rates, um, is, is simulation a way to sort of maintain proficiency when folks aren't getting um, actual practice and experience with various uh, rare procedures, et cetera? So lots of, I think, important questions that still remain to be answered uh, in the simulation space, and, and, and we're excited we're able to keep that work on. Just quickly jumping back, um, this uh, to the Patient Safety Learning Labs, that's the PSLL, sorry for the acronyms here, Request for Applications. This is one thing that was included in this most recent third round. And um, if you know anything about our agency, um, AHRQ, um, we've had some times over our lifetime where um, questions about what we do, you know, does it really matter? Um, and in some cases, unfortunately, policymakers don't completely understand the um, our, the role that we have, you know, we're not discovering the new drug or or the new treatment necessarily. We're up, we're downstream of that and, and healthcare delivery, as I've described. But um, and so what we have pushed our researchers to do is be much more explicit about how their work connects to the ultimate outcomes of interest, even if that's um, modeling and projection. Uh, that they don't have the complete answer for. We can, we can tolerate that uncertainty, especially at the front side of a, of a project. So this is just an example. I'd invite you to read that. Um, we are sort of putting our money where our mouth is in that regard. Um, this is our HAI program and some pretty groundbreaking work that we've done there, uh, actually changing the way care is delivered. The first project is about decol uh, uh, decolonization and the most uh, efficient ways to do that. Um, the thing that I would draw your attention to here is actual results that we have on a national scale um, with substantial numbers of organizations. Um, again, the heart of this program is, is the socio-technical uh, pulling those together. Um, so what are we looking at on a horizon? The um, challenges with diagnosis and diagnostic error. In some cases, in some cases we um, uh, do everything very well on the treatment side. Uh, again, treatment is executed perfectly, but uh, unfortunately, if the diagnosis is wrong, all that is sort of uh, doesn't really matter. So there's more recognition in the safety and quality world that um, we've got to spend uh, some more time and focus and energy emphasis, in fact, on making sure the diagnosis is right. And this leads us not only to 
processes of care, but also the cognitive processes, information systems, a lot of the same things we've been addressing on the treatment side, but um, a little bit different when you think about diagnosis where the main focus is on just getting the answer, um, again, so that we can uh, follow through with the right treatment. So that's one area of focus. Um, we're trying to also move outside the hospital more, extending patient safety improvements that I showed before to all healthcare settings. That's a bit more of a challenge because we have less of a system outside the hospital, less infrastructure, um, but nonetheless, we're still making some progress there. Uh, HAIs will continue to be a focus, including antibiotic resistance. Again, you see a lot of that in popular press, et cetera. Um, better measurement systems, as I, as I described, and also engaging patients more. This is that last slide that uh, said I would leave you with that I think is pretty hopeful. One of the things I discovered uh, about a year ago now is um, just one example of how I think the work that we do and also the work that you're doing is finding its way more into the mainstream. This is how the AMA sort of describes, um, I think, this big collection of work that, that we are responsible for and others like you. Um, and they've described it as the third pillar of medical education. That got my attention when you start talking about things as fundamental as that. The, the classic two pillars that they refer to are the basic sciences and the clinical sciences. That's the medical education that I received, um, you know, microbiology, uh, moving on to medicine, psychiatry, et cetera. You know, those are the, the, the two classic pillars that have existed for quite some time now. But I think, um, thankfully, groups like the AMA have recognized that those uh, continue to be important but they're not sufficient to really get us to where we need to be. So this is kind of a new collection uh, uh, of topics that frankly aren't new to us. It's been uh, the focus of our agency for, for um, I think, almost three decades now. But again, I think it's moving into the mainstream. So what's in this sort of uh, bucket of health system science? I think it's a lot of the issues re regarding quality. Um, the current uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services has sort of reestablished value in healthcare as one of his uh, four priorities. Uh, patient safety is well represented in this whole topic of health system science, as well as population-based care and looking at what we can learn from, from those views and those perspectives, not just treating patients uh, one at a time, but looking at uh, different groups of patients to see what's, what's possible and also recognition that we don't practice the same way we used to. It's not the independent practitioner sort of um, heroically, you know, coming up with the answer and taking a patient all the way through to treatment and cure. Um, it's actually teams where patients move uh, either in real, uh, in, in actual uh, spatial uh, space and time or virtually between teams and uh, between providers. And ultimately, it's that collective view that is responsible for for care. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, the AMA has also funded, I think, uh, almost 30 different schools to uh, integrate these topics more substantially into their curriculum. So I think, uh, you know, I'm imagining giving this talk or somebody giving this talk in 10 years and um, hopefully looking back and saying this was something that really pushed us even farther ahead and opened the door for um, this kind of thinking. So. With that, I'm going to stop. Um, our communications folks are really good at social media. I am not, but they have put me out there uh, sort of as uh, one of the faces. So um, we're on LinkedIn, obviously our website. Um, so I think we'll answer questions on the panel. Is that, yeah. So thank you for your attention.